Neuroimaging and Understanding the Mind. Previously, we said we are dropping the demarcation problem and now trying to draw a line within science, an epistemic the meaningful line between good and junk science. To do that, we said we will look at specific cases. We have already discussed cases of scientists cheating and getting caught, being falsely accused of cheating, and even what we call pathological science, a collective delusionary state in which some significant numbers of scientists see and report things that aren't real. Today and tomorrow, we will turn our attention to another perplexing possibility, a whole scientific discipline making little progress towards explaining and predicting the phenomena it studies despite decades of hard work by the best talent and billions in research investment. The examples concern the effort to understand the human mind. Two branches of science are locked in a fierce competition to explain how the mind works and predict and manipulate its processes. These branches of science are cognitive neuroscience and experimental psychology. We will discuss experimental psychology next time. Today, we will focus on cognitive neuroscience. To understand what cognitive neuroscience is, we need to first understand what neuroscience is. Neuroscience studies neurons and nervous systems. There are two sub-disciplines in neuroscience, clinical neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience. Clinical neuroscience consists of fields such as neuroanatomy, which studies the physical shape and structure of nervous systems, neurophysiology, which tries to understand the proper functioning of nervous systems and their ailments, and neurosurgery, which aims to treat the said ailments by surgical intervention. This is, by the way, the famous brain surgeon turned Republican politician, Ben Carson. On the other side of the spectrum, we have cognitive neuroscience, which studies how the neurons and nervous systems enact mental phenomena, such as perception, emotion, and ultimately, intentional behavior. Clinical neuroscience has characteristic methods, such as cadaver studies and vivisection. The best way of discovering the shape of the spinal cord, for instance, turns out to be cutting into someone, dead or alive, and looking at their spinal cord. If you are trying to understand smaller structures, such as neurons themselves, you might use microscopes. There is even room for using experimental genetics to be specific, a method called knockout mice. Scientists take a cloned mouse, selectively disabled, or so to speak, knock out part of its DNA, and see what it does. It's cruel, I know, but also very useful for investigating the possible genetic causes of nervous system illnesses. Of course, there is always room for good old doctoring as well. Experiences and published case studies by practicing physicians help a ton in advancing our understanding of neurophysiology and the effectiveness of surgical interventions. Finally, there are also modern imaging techniques such as MRI. Taking pictures of what is inside is immensely helpful, especially for diagnostic and surgical purposes. Cognitive neuroscience, however, is pretty much a one-trick pony. It relies singularly on neuroimaging, and in particular, one technique, fMRI. Here you might be wondering, what is fMRI and how does it differ from MRI? MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. fMRI stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. From the outside, they look identical. The subject is laid down on a tray and pushed into a machine with a hole in it. The machine makes some loud noises and somehow takes pictures of your insides. But how? How does the machine see inside you? Here's how it works. Your body, like everything else, has atoms in it. Different tissues have slightly different ratios of different atoms. For instance, muscle tissues have more nitrogen than fat. Bones have more calcium. What's more, each type of atom has its characteristic resonance frequency. That's a fancy term for vibration. Some atoms vibrate fast, some vibrate slower, and you can make them vibrate by exposing them to radio waves. 
The genius of the MRI machine takes advantage of this fact. The machine emits some radio waves and quickly switches to a listening mode, recording the frequencies of vibrations it is picking up from the subject's body. That recording then is used to draw a series of images that show the internal structures, even the positions and sizes of tumors. fMRI is MRI with a twist. The frequency of the radio waves it emits and listens to is specific to just one kind of atom, oxygen. Why oxygen? Because the brain consumes a lot of it. In fact, Brain cells use up so much oxygen that blood vessels in the brain have to contract to restrict the blood flow to the areas that are needed and allow blood flow to only those areas that are in use. If this did not happen, your brain would use up more oxygen than your lungs can supply, even if you are hyperventilating. So effectively, by detecting the oxygen concentrations, fMRI maps out the parts of the brain regions that are turned on, so to speak. What does that mean in concrete terms? This, imagine that you are the subject in the fMRI machine. Researchers show you a picture, a picture of a kitten, let's say. When you see the kitten picture, blood vessels in certain parts of your brain expand to carry more oxygen to the parts that are needed to recognize the animal in the picture. The fMRI machine detects the elevated oxygen levels in those brain parts and colors them differently than the rest. And then the researchers say, that must be the part that recognizes kittens. Of course, the reality is quite a bit more complicated, but this is enough for our purposes. Cognitive neuroscientists try to understand how the human mind works by identifying the places where cognitive functions are performed in the brain. For instance, motion detection happens mostly in the middle temporal visual area. Sadly, some people who have damage in this area suffer from a condition called motion blindness. They can look inside a room and tell you exactly what is there, but if you grab a coffee cup and toss it to them, they won't see it coming, even if it hits them squarely in the face. Another example, facial recognition happens mostly in the fusiform gyrus. Similarly, damage to this area leads to facial blindness. Patients who have this condition lose their ability to recognize faces, even those that are the most familiar to them. They can recognize their parents, spouses, or even themselves. Finally, the right auditory cortex is primarily responsible for musical perception. Those who have damage here lose their ability to recognize pitch and they cannot recognize familiar songs and they cannot sing. In other words, I'm describing myself, at least if you ask my wife. The point here is that these brain locations are called the neural correlates of cognitive functions. As you would notice, each correlate corresponds to a cognitive function such as motion detection, facial recognition, and musical perception. And that's why the tool is called functional MRI. It is supposed to tell us about the functions of brain parts. Jared Fodor, an influential philosopher of science and also a psychologist, is a bit skeptical, however. Fodor recognizes the clinical value of fMRI. Fodor argues, no doubt, if you are a surgeon, you may well wish to know which brain region is responsible for what, since you will wish to avoid cutting them out. But whereas, historically, studies of the localization of brain functions have often been clinically motivated, I take it to be currently the consensus that they have significant scientific import over and above their implications for medical practice. It is this historical trend that Fodor is skeptical about. He is critical of cognitive neuroscientists' use of the fMRI, specifically 
Fodor doesn't think that knowing the neural correlates would help us at all to understand how the mind works. Here's Fodor's worry in a nutshell. Knowing the location of something doesn't tell you much about its function. Take the carburetor, a car part for instance. Given the average age of my audience, I expect most of you not to know what a carburetor does. This is understandable because modern vehicles don't have carburetors. They have fuel injectors. Only old cars and old motorcycles have carburetors. Suppose that I told you the carburetor is to the left of the engine. Does that help you understand its function? Do you now understand what it does? Of course not. In fact, as far as its function is concerned, the location of the part is completely irrelevant. You can express its function in terms that are completely devoid of information about its whereabouts. The function of the carburetor is to mix the gasoline and air at a ratio that will enable combustion. Where that mixing happens is completely irrelevant, unless you are trying to fix an old car. Fodor thinks the same about neural correlates of cognitive functions. He thinks that they tell you nothing about how your mind manages to perform those functions. Unless you are a surgeon and you are trying not to damage your patient's brain, you shouldn't care about where motion detection, facial recognition, or musical perception happens in the brain. If you are trying to understand how the mind works, you should drop all the neural correlates talk and try to figure out how exactly does a brain part detects motion, recognizes faces, or perceives music, regardless of the part's location. This raises a question, of course. How else can we understand the function of a brain part? Psychologists like Fodor tend to think about systems as input-output machines. They take a set of inputs and give a set of outputs. Again, an automobile analogy might help here. Even if you don't know much about cars, you know that they move and they pollute. So, that's their output, motion and exhaust. You also know that cars burn gasoline and they need air for that. So, those are the inputs of a car. And notice, for simplicity, I'm completely ignoring the inputs from the driver here. Speaking of burning, it has to happen somewhere. A part which burns the gasoline to convert chemical energy into mechanical energy. Let's call that part the engine. Exhaust is easy. The burning generates carbon dioxide. You just put a pipe to let it out so that it can make the planet nice and warm for everyone. Motion is a bit more complicated. Let's say there is a box full of gears that takes the mechanical energy from the engine and transmits it to the tires so that they spin at the right speed. That takes care of the outputs. Going back to the inputs, for gas to get into the engine, it needs to be pumped from the gas tank. Similarly, there needs to be an air intake that filters the air so that the dust and the dirt don't get inside. And of course, there needs to be something that mixes air and gas at a ratio where combustion is possible. Too much gasoline, your engine will choke it won't get enough air to sustain combustion. Too much air is even worse. Car engines are cooled and lubricated in part by gasoline. You can overheat and destroy the engine if there is too much air. So you need a thingy that mixes air and gasoline just at the right ratio. And let's call that thingy carburetor. Now I hope you understand what a carburetor does. But Fodor isn't trying to teach you obsolete car mechanics. His point is that this approach can work on pretty much any system. Take a cognitive function such as face detection. We can do this all the time. Look at a power outlet, for instance. It looks like a face screaming, doesn't it? I'm sorry, but you will never be able to unsee that. 
How can your brain do that? How can it detect faces even in a mundane place like a power outlet? But forget about your brain for a second. How can any system detect faces? Let's design a simple face detection system that can scan an image and detect faces in it. Real life face detection is much more complicated than I can squeeze in here. So let's just assume that the faces in the image are going to be simple emojis like these. And the output is going to be the detection of a face or lack thereof. If you are making a robot, for instance, you can put an LED on that robot, which flashes when it sees a face, and it doesn't flash if it doesn't see any faces. The first task will be to recognize circular shapes. These are going to be the contours of a face. This is a simple task. Your system just needs to compare every closed curve in the image to a closed curve whose algebraic representation is of a circle. Then the system needs to look for two spots that are located in the upper part of the shape and are in contrast with the rest of the shape. These are going to be the eyes. Once it finds the eyes, the system then leads to look for a patch in the lower part of the shape that is again in high contrast to the rest. This will be the mouth. If all the steps can be executed successfully, the system will detect a face. If one or more is missing, it won't detect a face. Going back to Fodor's point about neural correlates, does it matter where in the brain or inside the fancy robot you made any of this stuff happens? Of course not. Just looking at this diagram is enough to understand how an organic or electronic system can recognize a simple face. No information about what happens where is necessary or even useful to help you understand a system from a functional point of view. In other words, the letter F, which stands for functional in fMRI, is a lie. It does not really give you any information about the function of a brain part. At this point, you might be wondering, what is the big deal? Why does it matter whether the information we get through fMRI scans is useful to understand the functional architecture of the mind or not? There are two reasons for concern here. First, fMRI is an expensive research tool. At the present time, one hour of fMRI research costs about $1,000. If photo is correct, and we can figure out how cognitive functions are executed just by thinking about them, just like we did, then fMRI is a waste of resources. And it's a waste of resources that are very finite. Research funds are limited. There is fierce competition for grant money. With the amount you would spend in a week on fMRI, you can fund the psychology lab for an entire year. If the information we get from fMRI is useless in understanding how the mind works, for example, cognitive neuroscientists are making a very expensive mistake. Besides, this mistake is likely on your dime. In the United States, over 90% of research is funded publicly. If photo is right, these people are taking your money, pouring gasoline on it, watching it burn, and calling it science. But we didn't get to the worst part yet. The worst part is just coming. The worst part is that there are serious concerns about the validity of the results reported in most fMRI studies. This fact is illustrated with perfect deadpan delivery in the post-mortem Atlantic Salmon paper by Bennett and his co-investigators. These people took a dead salmon. They stuck it in the fMRI machine, and showed the pictures, pictures of people interacting with each other. Then they asked the dead salmon, what are these people feeling? Then they scanned the dead salmon's brain. Lo and behold, it appeared that there were regions of elevated brain activity 
Of course, the point of the study was to advocate for statistical methods controlling for the false discovery and family-wise error rates. Yet, the very fact that they have to advocate for these corrective methods speaks volumes about the state of the literature in cognitive neuroscience. Most published papers don't use these corrective methods. Therefore, the results in most published papers might not be more reliable than a dead salmon can think about human emotions. If you are interested in reading more about this issue, I recommend an extensive meta-analysis I'm linking in the video description. The summary for those who don't have time or who are not technically inclined is this. Most fMRI studies report results that should not be possible to detect with the present technology and experimental design. The conclusion we seem to be approaching is a most disturbing one. Most results reported in cognitive neuroscience might be either empirically insignificant, as Fodor argues, or outright false positives. At this point, you might be wondering why cognitive neuroscience is like this. I'm not entirely sure. But I think that the explanation, whatever it is, will have to involve a combination of factors such as these. First and foremost, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that cognitive neuroscience is studying the most complex system we know of, the human mind. So the task before the scientists in this field is extremely difficult. What's more, perhaps Kuhn was right about science being mostly normal science. Most scientists don't question the fundamentals of their discipline most of the time. They operate under the assumption that fMRI is how you study the human mind. After all, it is the main experimental tool of their field. Besides, the authority structure in cognitive neuroscience is populated by people who are deeply invested in the people who are deeply invested in the use of the fMRI. If you are an up-and-coming researcher in cognitive neuroscience, you need to convince those folks that you are doing good science. And their conception of good science is sticking people in the fMRI machine and taking pictures of their brains. And finally, we should always remember that we are outsiders. We might be completely misunderstanding the situation. After all, telling the difference between good science and jump science takes a solid grasp of the underlying scientific concepts. Another thing that is hard to be sure about is whether or not we should brand cognitive neuroscience as a form of pathological science. As you might remember, pathological science has a number of salient characteristics. Some of these characteristics are present in cognitive neuroscience. For instance, for the most part, cognitive neuroscience is devoid of fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. What's more, most researchers in this field deny the accusations raised against their methodology and appear earnest in their denial. If Fodor is right and there is a mistake in validating their research, it is an unintentional mistake. If there is an unintentional mistake like that, however, its causes are different from the causes of pathological science. In particular, except for a rivalry with experimental psychology, there isn't any significant cultural or historical pressure on cognitive neuroscience to do what it is doing. Yet, both are collective. And finally, despite strong criticism from psychologists, philosophers, and many other scientists, there is no sign of relenting in cognitive neuroscience. In fact, it is a field that is expanding. So it's not clear whether we should identify cognitive neuroscience as a pathological field. But nonetheless, if its critics are to be believed, cognitive neuroscience illustrates that sometimes an entire branch of science can be epistemically suspect. Perhaps very little in cognitive neuroscience is worthy of belief. This continued expansion, however, is puzzling and perhaps alarming. It's an open question whether the mistakes will be corrected or the society will continue funding this field indefinitely. 
despite the fact that its results are mostly insignificant or false. Finally, yet again, we are reminded that there is no fast and easy way of distinguishing good science from junk science. The claim that most results reported in cognitive neuroscience are false, for instance, requires a level of technical competence that is hard to achieve. But this brings me to the end of this lecture. Send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you for your patience, and I'll catch you next time.